and you aspire to the concept of a more spiritual God who can't be imaged. The other way one can go with that material, which is where I see the harmonization with psychotherapy, is that you then can ask, well, where the heck did I come up with that particular image versus another particular image? And then you're into Freud's ballgame. And you can do both. You can both deconstruct your own tendencies to idolatry and pursue the theology and do therapy on the idolatry inclinations. And by the way, Jesuits have worked that out. They're already doing that. That's where I picked this idea up from. Um, they say basically that anything that's an obstacle between you and God has got to be recognized as an obstacle and find some way to, to get rid of those inhibitions. Then, okay, self-observation can lead you to another kind of behavior. This is Dante's portrait in hell where I got the idea. Um, a liar goes through life expecting to be lied to, afraid of being lied to. A thief goes through life expecting to be so stolen from, fearing always. So that Dante basically portrays the seven deadly sins as seven kinds of hell because of our own projective systems. What you're guilty of, you fear, being on the receiving end of. And in fact, we self-sabotage afterwards, right? This unconscious guilt gets us to self-sabotage on top of that. So all of this is a kind of moral self-education that is routinely done in certain schools of psychotherapy. I mean, and is totally conducive with the self-observation process. But it produces a moral transformation. And one of the Freudian schools, the, the British Middle School it's called, works on that consistently as one of the things you do with people. You get people to the point where they recognize they're destroying themselves by creating their own fear cycle. And what they're really doing is they're committing crimes against others that were committed against them as children. It was good enough for me, I'll dish it out to you, is the logic. And when love wins out over aggression, there is repentance. That's the process. That's the moral transformation. So that now, the love comes up, it seems to me, in the unit of experiences. I mean, we, we are a symbol-forming creature in our minds. And in our minds, any one thing can represent any other thing, including all things. So that one th you know, all eternity in a rose, or in a grain of sand, or a drop of water, right? That's the function of the symbol-forming function. It's got nothing to do with supernatural. It's got to do with mental processing of ideas. And it's inevitable, I think, if you let imagination go far enough, which is to say you boost it with psychedelics, that you start having unitive experiences. Now, interpersonally, that becomes, I hurt you when I hurt me. I hurt me when I hurt you and vice versa. Yeah, I got it backwards, but it works both ways. Because an eye for an eye and love thy fellow as thyself are the same emotional truth. Just one is meaner than the other. <laughs> but they're the same sense of reciprocity, of ultimate equivalence. So if you use unitive experiences to promote empathy, altruism, identity with others, love for others, you then have the love that you need to rein in aggression and produce moral transformation. Yeah? How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, I want to give you another basic concept. There are such things that Aristotle called abstract objects. The Middle Ages talked about uh, the best word I know is intelligible. So there's things you can see and things you can't see that are quite real. Like every law of nature you ever heard of, you cannot see. Because a law of nature expresses a relationship. You can see, you know, one mass and another mass and they attract at a certain rate. But the process of attraction is invisible. The relationship, the mathematically expressed relationship, is not perceptible. It's thinkable, but it's not perceptible. 
Now, the, the realm of the thinkable has been neglected in modern psychology because the word cognition and cognitive thinking covers perceptibles, imaginables, and intelligibles. So mental images is a cognition. A sense perception is a cognition, and an idea is a cognition. And as a result, we don't separate them out in our current psychology, and that's to our loss. Because the Middle Ages called intelligibles spiritual. That's in, in German, the language, the, the word Geist still means both spirit and intellect. Because all spiritual realities, think of, of basic things like honor, trust, faith. We're talking about invisible relationships among, between different actions. Think of revenge. What is the principle of causality in revenge? Somebody does something, somebody else does something else, there's a relationship. We have an idea of it, we have different emotions about it, right? The whole lot of, of psychotherapy is taking neurotic emotions towards relationships of this kind and replacing them so that instead of thinking revenge is a dumb idea, you think it's a great idea, right? There, there was one paper I read by an analyst in 1935. He talked about emotional syllogisms. Uh, the best, the, the funniest one I know is a Madison Avenue joke from the 50s. I don't know why he hates me. I never did him a favor. There's people like that. They cannot tolerate gratitude. If you make them feel gratitude, they hate you. And therapy is about changing those invisible relationships, those links. Five minutes, no problem. So, intelligibles is a big piece of what unitive thinking is about. What's mysticism? It's the, the awareness of the unitive nature of reality. Yeah? And for me, that's consciousness expansion. For me, what is in fact happening is an expansion of the quantity and variety and sophistication of the intelligibles with which you think. I mean, children below the age of puberty don't have many abstractions. They work much more concretely. And the acquisition of higher order abstractions gives you freedom from your own emotionality. They allow you to find your center, your balance, your poise, whatever you want to call it, and to make choices. Instead of feeling compelled by your emotions, you get to choose among them and fix the ones that are disordered, which allows for a higher order of morality, yeah? Now, I would like to suggest that the phenomenon that Jung called synchronicity is a perception of relationships. It's a perception of intelligibility that's out there in the world, not just in your head. Because the event really happens synchronously. It's not just love, honor, and things that are human projections. It's happening. What a coincidence. Now, with coincidences, you have two options. One is to say, oh, it's striking, but it's random. Or the other is, it's striking and it's non-random. It was intended. The intended option means you have to imagine a personal deity doing the intending, which gets me back to the biblical text. Um, the point I want to make is whichever route you go, Synchronicity is about the perception of opportunity. Something happens in the world and you have a choice to make. How are you going to handle it? Because a synchronous event confronts you with an opportunity. It's, a, it's like um, possibly a lesson, possibly a suggestion, however you want to take it. And there is always a time to choose between good and evil, or good and better, depending. And that's what it's really about, doing the Lord's work, ultimately, seems to me. So anyhow, that's the kind of program, wedding spiritual direction and psychoanalysis, that I imagine as the territory to be worked that covers the varieties of psychedelic phenomena. And within reasonable limits, non-denominationally. Or that is, it, I'm aspiring towards something that would stand a chance of being called a natural, spontaneous, inborn proclivity towards spirituality that is not overly loaded dogmatically. And that's my talk. 